All right, well, thank you everyone for attending uh, this conference and thank everyone for uh, staying through to at least to attend my talk. For those of you who don't know me, I am, I'm Patrick Newman. I wanna thank Andy Horde for sponsoring uh, this talk. It, it means a lot to me when people uh, sp sponsor these talks and, and, and they care about the, the Mises Institute and its scholars. Uh, so I apologize for being late to the conference. I wasn't here yesterday. Uh, Hurricane Milton Friedman hit Tampa <laughs> and uh, almost took out me and all of my Austrian economics books. It was getting really scary there, but it could have been a lot worse. It, it could have been a Hurricanes, uh, in fact. And, <laughs> and then I would have really been stuck in Tampa. I would have been stuck in a liquidity trap, actually. So anyway, okay, there we go. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I'm, 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 I'm really... I'm really glad to be at this year's Supporters Summit, which focuses on Albert J. Knox, our enemy of the state. Albert J. Knox was a, was a real hardcore libertarian. Uh, interesting little fact, he also had a career as a minor league baseball player, so I just thought that was an interesting factoid to bring out. Uh, and Our Enemy of the State is a great read. I highly recommend it if you haven't read it yet. It's a, it's a short little booklet. Uh, the title alone speaks volumes, right? Because the enemy of mankind in civilization, according to Knox, is precisely... <laughs> precisely the institution that people think is the savior of mankind, right? The state. The government, according to Nock, is not a Mr. Fix-It, right, who can wave his magic wand and solve all of the social problems of the day, right? Government causes the problems. Government is the enemy, right? And it's important that we read Nock because he tells us what we're up against, Right? This, is, this is why the ideas still matter for today. It's, 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 we, we have to know what we're up against and, and in a sense, how the system is un, unfortunately rigged in various ways. Right? So one of Knox's uh, main arguments in his book, and this is something that really influenced Murray Rothbard, is that governments do not originate through a social contract. Right? The social contract theory is very prevalent among political scientists, and it's what we all learn about in our history classes or our civics classes and, and, and so on. Uh, the idea of a social contract is that uh, people come together voluntarily, you know, uh, sort of like a business, and we all agree to a certain constitution or a certain written body of rules. We agree to relinquish some of our freedoms to pay a certain amount of money, aka taxes, to the government, and in return, the government provides us things. It provides us with law, in order, and it builds roads and all sorts of other things and public health and, 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 and all of that good stuff. And uh, Nock has a, has a slightly different opinion of this, right? As does Murray Rothbard. And, and governments originate through what Nock perceptively calls, quote, conquest and confiscation. Right? You're not gonna find that in a traditional uh, political science course, to say the least. And gov so governments, according to Nock, they arise through coercive means, right? Through, through force. Because right, historically what happened is that not all the people in the village got together and they all just were holding hands and they wrote, they wrote a document. What happened was a group of bandits came in, sort of a bunch of marauders. They had battle axes and everything. They had all the, all the rest of it. They, they, they roughed up a village. Um, they killed some people. They took some of the wealth. They didn't kill all the people and they didn't take all the wealth. Because the first thing about stealing, stealing 101, is that you don't kill the goose that lays the golden egg. You instead will just take a little bit of it, right? And then you come back the next year and you take the same amount, right? And you come back the next year, so on and so forth. Because instead you can extract sort of annual tribute, right? And the village will pay these marauders to say, please don't kill us. We'll just, we'll, we'll give you some gold. All right, we'll give you some of our crops or even some of our workers uh, and so on, right? This is actually historically where taxes originated from. This is not just Knox speculating. This is looking at the history of taxation in England and in uh, and, and, and various other countries, right? There were promises to invaders not to destroy a village. And that's kind of still what taxes are because if you don't fill out your IRS tax form, the similar thing will happen to your house, basically. It's not as if the government's gonna give you uh, a free pass at this, right? And the rationale of the bandits, of course, is to collect taxes and other favors to benefit themselves and their supporters at the expense of the public, right? This is why Nock says that, quote, the sole invariable characteristic of the state is the economic exploitation of one class by another. Right. That's the main characteristics. It's one class exploiting another. Or as Austrian economists would say, a little bit more accurately, it's a, 
a, a, a one cast that exploits another cast. And a cast is a, a group of people that are privileged through the government. You have the ruling caste, so they're the overlords, and then you have everybody else, the ruled, the ruled caste, right? Who are paying the taxes, suffering under the regulations, and so on and so forth. So in other words, the origins of government are examples of cronyism, okay? Uh, so for any of you taking bets on this, I said cronyism at about five minutes into my presentation. Uh, so I just want everyone to know uh, in case anyone was timing that. Uh, but so cronyism is, 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 has been defined as, is when governments pass policies that benefit special interests at the expense of the public overall, right? And I think cronyism is very important. Uh, the history of cronyism uh, is very important. I could say if only, if only someone was writing a book series on that subject, right? <laughs> um, uh, but uh, to, to our point here, Knox conquest story, most people say, okay, that makes sense for the Romans or some king or emperor. Yeah, that's how they got power. They killed some other people. They extracted tribute and all of that stuff. That, you know, governments arose through conquest back in, back in the old days. But what about modern democracies? Right? What about the United States? What about Western civilization, so to speak? You know, didn't they arise through voluntary means and majority consent? I mean, we were taught that the United States, or at least the modern United States, uh, arose, you know, it started with the U.S. Constitution, so wasn't that a social contract? Didn't we ratify the U.S. Constitution? And Nock takes this question head on, and if you, if you, if you read the book, you, you'll see that he spends most of the book on the origins of government in the United States. Right? Rothbard discusses this heavily in Conceived in Liberty, and I've also done so in, in, in the first cronyism book. I've written Cronyism, Liberty versus Power in Early America. And this is what I want to do in today's talk uh, as well, because I want to show how the United States Constitution was enacted through conquest. Not conquest by the sword, but conquest by the rigged constitutional coup d'etat and a rigged ballot box process. This is something not a lot of people know about. Um, and this is engineered by special interest groups looking to exploit the public, sort of a, an aspiring ruling caste, if you will, right? And I think this matters for today to go through this little bit of a history lesson because I think it's important that we understand that we're kind of, the system we're working under, right, the, the federal government, its U.S. Constitution, is unfortunately a rigged system in a way, and it was broken from the very beginning, right, from, from ground zero, so to speak. Okay, so what I've just said is obviously uh, really radical stuff because most people, uh, many libertarians included, think the U.S. Constitution limited the power of the federal government. We were taught that the founding fathers, these various esteemed figures, they're all on our paper money. Guys like George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, you throw in some others like James Madison, they all got together in Philadelphia, they spent the summer of 1787 drinking some coffee, writing up a document. Uh, they did it before ChatGPT, so it was, it, was, it was good old fashioned hard work. Uh, and it was a document that was for the people and it was not the elites, right? We the people. And then they presented to the average American, we all voted on it, we all got our little sticker that said I voted, and then bam, right, new government. So that's the story. And I'm here to say that the whole thing is a lie from the start to finish, right? So let's start with the Constitutional Convention. Uh, why was there a Constitutional Convention? A lot of people think that under the, original, the earlier governing uh, system, the Articles Confederation, there's all sorts of problems. I unfortunately don't have time to go into this, but, uh, I can say that it actually wasn't really that bad under the Articles of Confederation. And in Knox words, it was, quote, pretty good. All right, so, you know, it's, it's an A in my book, so to speak. Um, why there was this constitutional convention is because there were very special, very special interests who weren't getting the cronyism right, that they wanted. There were speculators in federal and state debt that they wanted higher taxes to basically fund the debt that they had bought at a discount. Uh, bankers wanted a federally chartered uh, monopoly central bank to provide credit expansion. Uh, Northern shippers and manufacturers, they wanted protective tariffs and various regulations. Shippers wanted regulations on other uh, shipbuilders and so on. Manufacturers wanted tariffs. And merchants wanted a stronger military in the Midwest and a navy in the Caribbean to kind of strong arm various trade agreements and so on. But in each case, 
the states under the Articles of Confederation shot down these various special interest policies, right? Um, <clears throat> so the special interest cooked up a story that they were only going to, quote, amend the Articles of Confederation, right? Uh, in reality, they wanted to create an entirely new federal government that was much more powerful than the states. Okay, so it was, in a sense, a coup, and this is freely admitted in academic works on the subject. They call it a coup, but they say it was an honorable coup in the public interest, right? But these special interests, they called themselves federalists as if they wanted a balance of power between the federal government and the states, right? But that wasn't really accurate. They wanted to make the federal government much more powerful than the states. And the whole federalist plan was this. You create a stronger central government that looks limited, Right? Power would be spread between the executive, the legislative, and the judicial branches. And the explicitly enumerated powers of the federal government would be limited. Right? So saying what the federal government can explicitly do, it's going to be a relatively short list. But of course, as Nock and as Rothbard have, have pointed out, there are some flaws in this. And uh, the first flaw is regarding how power would be spread out among the branches. There's nothing to prevent the executive, the legislative, and the judicial from working together. Right? They don't necessarily have to be against each other. They can sort of uh, form a cartel, if you will, and just decide to increase all of their power together. Uh, the second problem is that <laughs> uh, the government explicitly couldn't do many things, but all of the heavy lifting, all of the justification for the various special interest policies I went through would be done through these so-called, quote, vague clauses, the necessary and proper clause, the general welfare clause, and so on. So on paper, these clauses, they don't say the government could do certain things, but with the right interpretation, right, uh, they can be interpreted in any way, uh, in such a way that allows the federal government to pretty much do whatever it wants. They're the Trojan horse, if you will. You know, they're unsuspecting and innocent from the outside, but deep inside there's, there's, a, there's a bunch of, uh, uh, there, there's all sorts of problems, so to speak. So take Murray Rothbard, who in an unpublished interview from the 1970s, spoke about how free market types believe that, quote, various clauses were corrupted by later judges to allow greater power to the federal government. Actually, these clauses were put in deliberately by Hamilton, Madison, and others, precisely in order to make it a strong government. They knew what they were doing, Madison and Hamilton. Hamilton was very bright, a very smart Mephistophelian figure, and Madison was a typical opportunist. Right. So you got to love Rothbard. He takes two of America's most cherished founding fathers. He calls one of them a snake oil salesman, right? He basically says Madison, the opportunist, and he calls the other the demon from Goethe's Faust who takes people's souls. So, you know, <laughs> if only Hamilton is Mephistopheles, that was the musical that we had, right? I would, I would, pay, I would pay good money for that one, right? But his point is entirely correct because the Constitution was always designed to be a big government document. The vague clauses were deliberately vague and allowed for incredible leeway. The Federalists did this because they knew the public wouldn't support the government if they explicitly enlisted all of the powers that, would, that, 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 um, that they would have. And this is borne out in the Constitutional uh, Convention debates and so on where they say, no, 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 the power to charter a central bank, it's in the general welfare clause according to Gouverneur Morris, who was a prominent Federalist at the convention. All right. So how exactly did the Federalists fasten their constitution on the American people? And I say fasten because it's admitted, it's admitted that a majority of the population opposed a stronger central government at the time. The Federalists conquered the people, so to speak. Again, not through military conquest, but through voting manipulations and broken promises. And haven't we heard that story before, right? So first, the Federalists said that only nine out of 13 states needed to ratify the new Constitution. Remember back then, the Constitution had, uh, you know, there, excuse me, under the uh, original American government, there were the 13 uh, states, right? Under the Articles of Confederation, any amendment required unanimous ratification by each state legislature, right? So the state legislatures all had to vote. And this blocked a lot of special interest policies because all it took was one state, right? Particularly Rhode Island or New York, to basically block the giving the articles, the, Con the Confederation Congress, excuse me, the power to tax, right? But so how would states ratify this constitution? How would nine out of 13 of the states ratify the constitution? Not through the state legislatures, but through special state conventions. And this was done deliberately to sort of circumvent the state legislatures because they knew they would oppose the constitution. Now, the delegates to these special state conventions would be decided by popular vote, but here was the rub, is that many of the rural districts 
um, that opposed the Constitution, which had a majority of the population, uh, had very low representation at the conventions, as opposed to the Federalist districts on the commercial seaboard. So, for example, in South Carolina, the state we are in today, a majority of the delegates voted for the Constitution, but they only represented 39% of the state's population, right? Uh, 39%, right? In New York State, which was a fierce battleground, it was only 34%. This basically meant that the Federalist minority was able to elect, you know, by design, a majority of the delegates in the various states to tilt the conventions to their favor. And even then, the states barely, like only barely ratified, right? New York, for instance, barely ratified the Constitution by 3027, right? It's a really close football game. It's like a field goal, basically, right? But I mean, it's, 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 it was two votes, more or less. Right. And last but not least, the Federalists employed many dirty tricks at state conventions. They bribed delegates. Uh, but most prominent was their promise to enact structural amendments to the Constitution after ratification. Amendments that ex ex explicitly limited the power of the government to tax, to borrow, to have standing armies, and so on. And they said, look, uh, we, yeah, you make some good arguments, but just pass this thing now and we'll do it later. Right, mm -mm -mm. big mistake, big mistake number one. The Federalists had no intention of passing these amendments. According to George Washington's secretary, the amendments, quote, were drawn up more with a view of softening and conciliating the opposition than from an expectation that they would ever be engrafted in the Constitution. Precisely, right? So that's the spirit. When you can't get what you want from the people, you simply lie to them, right? That's, that's the idea. And one of my favorite stories is that in some cases, the Federalists did literally employ outright force. Little Rhode Island refused to ratify the Constitution even after Washington's presidency began in 1789. So the new U.S. Senate threatened the state by passing draconian legislation prohibiting trade with Rhode Island, right? Basically saying no one in the United States can trade with Rhode Island. This appalled an opposing senator from Pennsylvania, William McClay, who considered the practice the method of a tyrant, quote, meant to be used the same way that a robber does a dagger or a highwayman a pistol, end quote, right? So quite literally conquest in that case. And Rhode Island still only ratified by just one vote, 34 to 32, right? Quite, quite fascinating. So this is how the Federalists uh, secured their constitution, not through social contract, but through conquest. Right, Not through unanimous or even majority consent, but through minority rule, through bribery, through intimidation, and broken promises. Or, in the words of Nock, the Constitution was only, quote, affected with great difficulty and only through a coup d'etat, organized by methods which, if employed in any other field than that of politics, would be put down at once as not only daring, but unscrupulous and dishonorable. And I have to agree with him. That's the truth. That's the real story of the founding of the modern American government. We aren't told, right? And the special interests, they passed their new constitution. And then during the Hamiltonian years of the 1790s, they got everything what they wanted, right? They got the whole kit and caboodle, so to speak. I think it's important that we understand this in this modern era, because as I mentioned before, it's, it's, it's important that we, we kind of comprehend what we're up against. This isn't a government that was designed to be limited, but a government that was designed to be used however the rulers in charge want it to be used, right? And this is sort of the reality that kind of explains, in a sense, why we're here uh, today, right? Why the government, why it's, it's grown to be this way. Not saying, of course, the Federalists are omniscient, but they had an idea of what they were doing. Right. Okay, so I want to end with this. So I don't know if this was mentioned on Friday, but um, Albert J. Nock saw his task as communicating to what he called, quote, the remnant. Right? And the remnant, I think that's a great phrase. It's very memorable. All right, so who is Nock referring to? Nock was referring to independent people who search out knowledge on their own and they care about the world. Right? They don't need to directly be taught, but they, 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 they want to search out knowledge for their, for, for their own sake. Right? In I think that's exactly what the Mises Institute is about. The Mises Institute is, is, is an organization for the remnant, right? <laughs> for the students who are interested in these ideas, for the hardworking families who are interested in these ideas, for the retirees who are interested in learning, obtaining knowledge for their own sake to better themselves. And I can say with confidence and with pride that this is a gathering of the remnant. So thank you very much. <laughs>